there, everyone. My name is Ari, and welcome to Made of Metal, a motivational podcast where we tell stories about regular people overcoming insurmountable odds. So today, I'll be telling the story of one of my absolute favorite people in all of history, which is a high honor coming from me, as there's so many historical figures that I adore. Huge history nerd here, so let's get right into it. Today, we'll be talking about someone who transcended life to become an immortal legend on the mat, the dance floor, and the big screen. This person was the epitome of cool, calm, and collected, with tons of charisma to boot. This person exuded an air of peace, understanding, and an inner confidence and grounded knowing that anyone could see and admire a mile away. This person was known to the world as the great, the powerful, the ever-serene Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee was born Lee Jun Pham on November 27, 1940, in San Francisco, California. Bruce was the fourth child born to his mother and father. His more well-known moniker, Bruce, was given to him by a nurse in the hospital he'd been born. He didn't begin to actually use the name Bruce until he started studying the English language in secondary school. After Bruce was born, his family would return to Hong Kong, where he would be raised. The family returned during a terrible and tumultuous time as Hong Kong was occupied by the Japanese during World War II. This time period is often described as the darkest in Hong Kong's history, as the residents faced the daily sorrows and brutalities of war each day. It was reported that Bruce was being bullied and began learning martial arts to defend himself against local gangs. Bruce was also known to get into a bit of trouble himself, running the streets and being a generally rough young boy. At 13, Bruce was introduced to Master Ip Man. Master Ip Man had built his legacy as a Grand Master of Wing Chun, and was one of the greatest and most respected martial artists of all time. At the young age of 13, Bruce had the vision to want to improve himself and chose one of the most influential and strongest martial artist teachers that was currently known to man. Bruce studied under Ip Man for about five years until around the age of 18. Bruce had nothing but the utmost of respect for his teacher, and they remained friends all throughout Bruce's life. Not to be understated, Bruce was a man of very many talents. He was a brilliant creative and a known entertainer, even from a young age. During Bruce's high school years, and foreshadowing with his later life, he won an influential championship boxing tournament. Bruce was also described as an amazing dancer, and won a Hong Kong Cha-Cha Championship. I wanted to highlight these two accolades as an example of the range of Bruce's talents. Bruce studied martial arts with the same vigor as his dance routines. It has been noted that Bruce had a notebook where he documented over 100 Cha-Cha steps. In addition to being a remarkable dancer and a dangerous fighter, Bruce was also an experienced child actor. Bruce's talent for showmanship and performing was not lost on his family, and Bruce had appeared in many films before the age of 18. As Bruce approached his 18th birthday, he began experiencing a shift in his lifestyle. Bruce had been getting into trouble with local gangs and fighting in general. His parents, of course, wanted Bruce to focus more so on academics and were not pleased with his performance. With Bruce's behavior seemingly not improving, Bruce's parents decided to send him overseas to America. In 1959, Bruce made his faithful journey to San Francisco. Bruce arrived on the shores of America on his own with $100 to his name and nothing else. While Bruce was born in America, Hong Kong had always been home. Bruce had left all he'd known to take a chance in a foreign country. After arriving in America, Bruce shortly left San Francisco and traveled to Seattle to connect with a family friend that agreed to give Bruce a job and a place to stay. Bruce was described as fun and playful, 
always charming, but also focused and determined. He'd loved dancing and acting, but chose to put those passions on the back burner while he pursued his education. Bruce attended the Edison Technical School to earn his high school credits, then enrolled in University of Washington. Bruce's interest and passion for martial arts, which used a combined mind-body-soul approach, inspired him to major in philosophy. Bruce was able to fund his education and attend school by teaching martial arts to willing students. It all began with a group of friends that recognized Bruce's talent and paid him to teach them his techniques. This group, along with others in Bruce's life who recognized his passions for teaching martial arts, encouraged Bruce to open a real school to the public. Bruce would go on to open his first school. And in a romantic twist of fate, one of his first students became his future wife. As Bruce continued to work at the school, watch his students improve, and watch his own life satisfaction increase, Bruce devoted his full time to learning and teaching martial arts. Bruce and his wife, Linda, left Seattle and moved to Oakland, California. Bruce realized it was time to expand his teachings and left his school in Seattle to be led by one of his past students. In Oakland, Bruce opened a second school with James Lee, who was another martial arts pioneer. It's incredible to think about But by the time Bruce had opened his second school, he had only been in the United States for five years. In 1964, Bruce was challenged to a one-on-one fight by members of an opposing school. They believed that it was wrong that Bruce was teaching his ways to non-Chinese students and that it was a part of their culture that it was only exclusive to those who were truly Chinese. Bruce was described as someone who would never back down from a challenge. As he'd grown, he'd become self-assured, focused, and confident in his fighting skills. Naturally, Bruce accepted the challenge and invited the men to fight at his school. Once the men arrived, the terms were set. If Bruce was defeated, he would stop teaching his martial arts to those who were not Chinese. The fight began and was over quite quickly. It ended with his opponent giving up as Bruce had him firmly pinned to the floor. Bruce was victorious. He had bested his opponent and retained his freedom to teach martial arts to whom he pleased. Though Bruce had won the fight, he was disappointed in his performance. What part of his triumphant fight was disappointing to Bruce, you ask? He was unhappy with the fact that he was unable to win the fight in under three minutes. This was his biggest critique of himself, not meeting the insanely high standards he had set for himself. That alone speaks volumes about his character. As Bruce's popularity began to grow within the martial arts teaching community, he set his sights on opening more schools. In 1964, while continuing to further his education in martial arts and develop personal fitness, Bruce was invited to give a demonstration at the first international karate tournament. Bruce's incredible performance was noticed by an acquaintance of a producer named William Dozier. William was just as impressed after viewing a film of the tournament. He called Bruce and invited him to fly to Los Angeles for a screen test. After dealing with more than a few sudden life changes and transitions, including the birth of his son and the death of his father, Bruce again began to pursue acting roles. Capitalizing on his amazing charm, charisma, and showmanship, plus years of experience obtained during his formative years, Bruce was made for the big screen. Early on in his career, although Bruce was a dynamic individual, he had to work harder than others to establish himself in Hollywood. This was due in part to unfortunate stereotypes and racism that was present against immigrants from foreign countries during that time period. Bruce was also not a recognized face just yet, making it difficult for directors to take a chance on him. Bruce did receive a few acting roles, but maintained support for his family, teaching private martial arts sessions. During this time, Bruce was teaching his own discipline that he'd call Jeet Kune Do. Bruce's student population had changed as well, in that he was teaching more so to those that worked in the entertainment industry. 
Bruce had more than a few noteworthy students, including Steve McQueen and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. In 1969, Bruce's daughter was born, and Bruce continued to evolve and progress his Jeet Kune Do. The next year, as Bruce began to work hard at his training, he suffered a tragic back injury. The injury was devastating, including significant nerve damage, constant pain, and a significant loss of mobility. Anyone that has had chronic back pain understands just how much of a change this was for someone as fit and independent as Bruce. The mental toll was just as devastating as the physical, as Bruce was put on bed rest for a full six months. While he was frustrated with his current situation, Bruce used the time to go inward and develop his mind against the daily limitations. Bruce studied philosophy regularly and enjoyed developing his mind just as much as his body. Bruce wrote, read, and eventually created a recovery program for himself in order to get him walking again. Bruce created his own way when there was seemingly no way. While recovering from his back injury, Bruce decided to visit his home in Hong Kong with his son, who was five at the time. Word of Bruce arriving in Hong Kong soon spread, and he was contacted by a producer who offered him roles in two films. With his body healing, Bruce was not able to train and teach as he'd been doing for so long. Bruce accepted the offer and decided that he would work his way up the entertainment industry in Hong Kong. Bruce left America and flew to Thailand to begin filming for his first movie called The Big Boss in 1971. This film was later called Fists of Fury, and it was a huge hit. Before beginning filming on his second film, Bruce decided to move his family to Hong Kong to be closer to him while he was working. Bruce's second film was an even bigger smash hit than his first. This wasn't a good luck streak. Bruce gave 100% of himself to whatever he dedicated his attention to. He didn't allow his physical state or this sudden change of pace to disrupt his passion. With Bruce's third film, he had formed a production company with Raymond Chow, the director with whom he made his first two films. Bruce was able to really express his creativity as he'd wrote and directed along with produced this film. This third film was another smash hit in his streak of blockbusters. Just that last year, Bruce had been completely bedridden with a crushing back injury. Six months later, Bruce was living out his passion, watching his dreams come into reality. In 1972, while Bruce was filming his fourth movie in Hong Kong, Warner Brothers reached out to make a deal for co-production rights on a film. This was groundbreaking in Hollywood at the time, making it the first ever Hong Kong American partnership produced film. Bruce's success in Hong Kong had made waves and Hollywood was listening. The deal was made and Bruce began filming Enter the Dragon. The film was set to premiere in Hollywood's Chinese theater in 1973. One month before the film premiere, Bruce began to complain of a small headache. After taking a pill to help with the pain, Bruce laid down and unfortunately fell into a deep coma. Shockingly, Bruce did not survive his coma. After Bruce's death, it was determined that he had a fatal allergic reaction to an ingredient in the pill. Of course, a legacy such as Bruce's never dies. Following his death, his film gained a massive cult following. Bruce himself became a historical icon, not just for his amazing fighting skills and spectacular performances on film. It was his charm, charisma, and thoughtful insights about life, being oneself, and living one's truth. You can find many a quotes from Bruce Lee, but I'll leave you with one of his most famous. Empty your mind. Be formless. Shapeless, like water. If you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle and it becomes the bottle. You put water into a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. You can find Made of Metal on Instagram at Made of Metal Podcast. We're on Facebook as well with the same name. That's Made of Metal Podcast. 
M-E-T-T-L-E. In the meantime, if you'd like to support, please subscribe, follow, and leave a review on any platform that podcasts are available. I love, love, love the positive feedback I've received so far, and I appreciate so much those who are listening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Until next time, lovelies, bloom where you are planted. Thank you.